In the beginning, numbers were whole. They were created for the sole purpose of counting how many things there were and conveying that information to someone else. Those were the natural numbers. However, as society grew, so did math. Man realized that at times it needed something to describe nothing at all. Thus, zero. This concept of zero, of nothingness, as a number, was the first true innovation in mathematics. What we have so far, the combination of zero with the natural numbers, are called the whole numbers. Mankind didn't stop there. Our need to discover made our ancestors wonder what would happen if you took away more than you had. Instead of just labeling that as impossible and walking away from the whole issue, we created a new type of number, the negatives. The creation of the negative numbers was a turning point in the history of mathematics because from this point onwards, unsolvable problems weren't problems. Instead, they became opportunities to discover previously hidden realms in the world of mathematics. The negative and the whole numbers collectively form the set of numbers called integers. The integers, as we have them, can be arranged in such a way as to form a line with zero in the middle and positive and negative numbers on its two sides. This is the classical number line. By looking at the number line, a question soon arises. What lies between the integers? Take, for example, one-third. It isn't an integer itself, yet it does lie on a definite point on the number line. Additionally, when we convert it into a numeral, we get a repeating sequence that trails off into infinity. All numbers of this sort that either end at a finite point or result in a repeating sequence are called rational numbers. All rational numbers, which includes integers, can be expressed as a fraction or a finite integer divided by another finite integer. However, numbers aren't always rational. There are some numbers, such as the square root of 2, that cannot be expressed as a fraction. Instead, they meander off into infinity never quite repeating the same sequence. These are called irrational numbers. Some irrational numbers do have a pattern, such as the classic 1.2345, etc., while others, such as pi, appear to be completely random. All of the numbers discussed thus far, natural, whole, negative, rational, and irrational, fall into the category of what is known as the real numbers. The real numbers are what pretty much everybody knows about, but it turns out that there are other types of numbers out there. The class of numbers that we will be focusing on today are known as the imaginary numbers. The imaginary numbers were discovered in an attempt to solve a very curious problem. What is the square root of negative 1? It can't be a negative, because a negative times a negative is always positive, and it definitely cannot be zero or positive. What is it then? The answer, as it turns out, is none of the above. Instead, in order to fill up this gap in mathematical reasoning, we created a number called i. i is, by definition, the square root of negative one, nothing more. Now here's where things begin to get interesting. You see, for all intents and purposes, i can be treated like any other number. If you wanted the imaginary equivalent of, say, 3, then all you need to do is take 3i. For 2, 2i. For negative 3, negative 3i, and so on. In fact, we can create imaginary versions of every single point on the number line. The obvious question that arises is, where do we put all these extra numbers? The answer, as it turns out, is to bring math to a new dimension. 
in order to make room for imaginary numbers, we turned the number line into a plane. The Argand plane, as it is often called, is constructed in the following way. The real numbers are arranged in the standard line formation along the x-axis. The imaginary numbers are put in place of what would normally be the y-axis. This formation allows us to plot what happens when we add a real number to an imaginary number. This real imaginary combination is called, unsurprisingly, a complex number. In the Argand plane, all complex numbers can be plotted out as individual points. Take, for example, 5 plus 3i. You place the point 5 to the right on the real axis and 3 upwards on the imaginary axis. An interesting thing about complex numbers is that they aren't just a collection of real and imaginary numbers. They behave like single numbers. You can use the rules of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division the same way as with real numbers, and every complex number has its own unique point on the Argand plane. Now that we have a basic idea of complex numbers, we could have a bit of fun with them. First, let's look at how complex numbers relate to zero. So far, we have gotten a given complex number by moving x units to the right and y units up, but what about a line that directly connects zero with our number? It turns out that that distance is actually the absolute value of that complex number. This makes sense if you think about it, because, if you remember from pre-algebra, the definition of a number's absolute value is its distance from zero. The absolute value of a complex number can be calculated by simple application of the Pythagorean theorem. Now, let's move on to addition. When we add two complex numbers together, say 4 plus 2i and 2 plus 3i, Instead of having to add the real parts separately from the complex parts, all that we need to do is stack up their absolute values. Or, put another way, when you add two complex numbers together, the result will always form a parallelogram between itself, the original two numbers, and zero. Another useful trick to know is that if you multiply any complex number by i, all you need to do is rotate that number 90 degrees counterclockwise around zero. This is because, by definition, i times i is negative 1, negative 1 times i is negative i, negative i times i cancels each other out to 1, and 1 times i is obviously i. If you multiply by 2i, then you just rotate 180 degrees, 3i, 270 degrees, and so on. Therefore, multiplication by an imaginary number is a simple rotation. What about multiplication? As we did with addition, let's take a look at our number's absolute values. Take, for example, 3 plus i1 times 2 plus i3, which we'll call z and x. It's basic algebra that the absolute value of zx is the same as the absolute value of z times the absolute value of x. Therefore, all you need to do is multiply the two lengths together to know how far away zx is from zero. But what about its position? Since it involves some trigonometry and is rather complicated, I won't show the proof here, but it turns out that on the complex plane, angles add. To figure out zx's position, you simply take the angle between z and the real number line and add the angle of x with the real number line. Then, multiply z and x's absolute values together to find how far away to put zx from zero. As you can see, imaginary numbers can be dealt with using pretty much only geometry. There are other ways of approaching the matter, of course, but this method is the most intuitive and useful. As for what imaginary numbers can be used for, there are many applications out there, from creating stunning fractal patterns like this one, to solving problems in electrical engineering. One thing that imaginary numbers teaches us, and that I hope you got away from this tutorial, is that in even the simplest of questions, worlds of detail and beauty can be found.